is Kathy Attar. I'm the Toxics Program Manager for Physicians for Social Responsibility. And uh, PSR is excited to present this evening's webinar entitled, How to Counsel Patients on Preventing Environmental Exposures. And we're going to be looking at how healthcare providers can better educate their patients and the public about reducing exposed environmental pollutants found in everyday products, our homes, workplaces, and neighborhoods. To decrease risk of toxic exposures and prevent the de development of environmentally related diseases like asthma, learning disabilities, and certain cancers, healthcare providers must be trained in environmental health. Unfortunately, very few are. And PSR is seeking to help fill this void by offering Train the Trainer webinars given by experts in the field of environmental health. And our, our training is going to be a two-step process. First, we're going to train the trainer, which is what tonight's webinar is all about. And then, hopefully, we would like, uh, once you are trained, to train new pr practitioners, new residents, new nursing students, et cetera. And our goal is to train an adequate number of health professionals so that they can then begin offering these presentations to, like I said, area residency programs, nursing programs, community clinics, and the public as well. And hopefully what we're looking to, to do is have this second level of training convey important skills to newly trained health professionals, allowing them to offer preventative health guidance to their patients, and we hope also piquing their interest in becoming policy advocates. And as you probably are aware, PSR is, um, we do quite a bit of environmental health policy advocacy, and we're always looking for healthcare providers to be champions in our various policy pro programs. And so this webinar, this e tonight's webinar is the first of three. And uh, for the second webinar, our presenter is going to be Joanna Congleton, and she's a toxicologist and senior scientist with the Environmental Working Group, and she's also uh, a national PSR board member. And she's going to be providing her expertise for the second talk in this series, and she's going to be speaking about endocrine disrupting chemicals. And this second webinar is going to be happening on April 19th. And then the third and final webinar, which is going to be happening in May, will be focusing on prenatal exposures and the vulnerability of the developing fetus. And so for this evening, my presenter is Elizabeth, Dr. Elizabeth Neary. And Dr. Neary is a pediatrician who was in private practice in Madison, Wisconsin for over 15 years. She completed her medical school and residency training at the University of Wisconsin. She's also a member of the Committee on Environmental Health in the American Academy of Pediatrics and is on the steering committee of the Wisconsin Environmental Health Network, which is a group of health professionals such as doctors, nurses, midwives, environmental advocates. Um, with her colleagues at WEN, she has presented on environmental topics to residents medical students and undergraduates at the University of Wisconsin. And she recently presented data to legislators at the state capitol in support of a bill to lower blood blend levels for intervention in Wisconsin. So before I turn it over to Dr. Neary, who's going to be doing the formal presentation, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping uh, issues. So your, your lines are going to be muted, um, so we can just reduce or limit the background noise. And also, this webinar is going to be recorded recorded for future use, and it's going to be put up on our website. <clears throat> and then uh, finally, in terms of questions, we're going to be taking questions at the end of the presentation. However, you can submit your questions at any time by typing them into the chat question panel. And um, I'll be looking those over, and then after Dr. Neary's finished with her presentation, we're going to be answering those. Okay, and I think that's it for me. Um, now I will turn it over to Dr. Neary. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kathy. And welcome to everyone tonight, nurses, doctors, physicians, assistants, uh, whoever else is there. Um, you already probably know a significant amount about environmental health, but my goal tonight is to add to your knowledge in a very short hour. And I want more than anything what I do want to do is inspire you to learn more. So let's get started. So the learning objectives on the next slide. I want to describe how certain groups are more susceptible. I want to discuss a couple of major environmental concerns, and I'm using a couple of case examples. I want to give you some credible resources for you to 
use later on. And in fact, if you have a smartphone, a nice idea is when I give you some references to actually take a snapshot of that and then you have that if you ever need it in any clinic. I want to identify some teachable moments because as busy clinicians, you know how hard it is to incorporate one more thing in your busy day. There's just so much to cover. Um, and then I want you to understand the impact of policy change. So the outline is first looking at the special susceptibilities of children, the scope of the problem, the, your role as a healthcare provider, a couple of key topics that we'll cover. I'll only hit briefly on the endocrine disrupting chemicals because that'll come up in the next talk, and again, resources. So are children more vulnerable? Well, children have greater exposure to toxins than adults. They eat more food, they drink more water, they breathe more air per kilogram of body weight. When you think about an infant, think of an infant, zero to six months old, they actually, their entire diet would be breast milk or formula. They also consume seven times as much water as an adult. And when I think of the situation in Flint, and I think about potentially some of those children who were drinking that contaminated water in their formula, it just really emphasizes how much more children are affected by any of these environmental toxins. The other thing is children have unique behaviors. They live closer to the ground, they roll around in the grass, they put things in their mouth, they're lower down, so if there's a toxin coming off a carpet or they're closer to the dust, they're just closer to it and get more of it. The other thing they do is have finicky eating habits. Some children eat the same food every day. I read a case report of a nine-year-old boy who uh, presented with gait problems and some mental issues. And the doctor asked questions about what he did every day. Well, it turns out the child ate tuna fish every single day for lunch for an entire year. So that's the thing that sometimes kids do that we have to investigate more carefully. Also, the infant gut is actually more permeable. The infant liver is more immature and less able to detoxify. And at the same time, children are rapidly growing. So their brains are developing, organs are developing, they're laying down new bone. I just heard of a new report of strontium in the water in Wisconsin. And I was like, what is strontium? And I had to go back to my periodic table. Um, but if that's in the water and the children are exposed to it, it's going to incorporate into the bones in the same way that um, calcium would. So new things coming up all the time. Another concept I really want you to know about is the concept of windows of susceptibility. And this, this concept really came through when I read some breast cancer studies of looking at endocrine disrupting chemicals because the breast tissue is uniquely sensitive at a number of different times in life, prenatal, neonatal, uh, puberty during pregnancy, and again uh, at perimenopausal time. So that we learn that a chemical at certain times has a greater effect than other times. And again, when you think about the third lecture you're going to hear about, when you're hearing about the impact in prenatal life, one day could make a difference. The other thing I want you to look at is this photo. So here's the girl. She's got the fingernail polish on. The big, the big word in breast cancer um, today is breast cancer can be prevented and we should be doing it in childhood. This, to me, is a window of opportunity. In practice, I saw so many little girls with fingernail polish on that, that when I would see that, that would be the trigger to me. I need to talk about this. So that was one way I could weave it into the practice. In fact, one day I saw a six-month-old with nail polish on her toes while she was chewing her toes while I was examining her. So it was like a perfect opportunity to just kind of bring it in to the conversation while I was doing the physical exam. And there's some terms to understand. I don't have um, a degree in epidemiology. I don't have a degree uh, master's of public health. So I think it's really important to understand these, this terminology. So I'm going to use lead as the first one to explain primary, secondary, tertiary prevention. So the primary prevention is what we really want with lead is to not allow a child to even ever be exposed to it. So a family that comes in and says, oh, I'm going to uh, renovate my 1926 house right then in there, you have a conversation with them about what they need to do, to do to prevent their child from being exposed to lead. Secondary prevention is what we generally do. It's using the venous blood screen. And tertiary would be, uh, there would be elevated levels in an apartment building and the number of children, and they'd, they'd go in and um, remove the lead from the 
the walls or repaint the apartment. Um, another important um, term is the precautionary principle. So what the precautionary principle is, as it's described there, that in the face of serious harm to health and a lack of scientific certainty, that preventive measures are taken. And you can look at that even in the situation that we're looking at now with Zika virus. At early on, it's like, well, do, does it really cause it? Or is that the cause? Well, you actually just take the precautionary principle even when the cause, of, cause and effect isn't known. Like, when is it enough to act or not act? Um, and if the exposure is really serious, you might not want to wait until you can prove it because over the course of 10 more years, more people may be exposed. Another concept that's important to understand is the dose makes the poison. That's not exactly true. There are some things where any dose is poison, um, and that, that goes for lead especially. But then when you look at endocrine disruptors, they're harmful at very low levels, and that's important to know. So here we are. We're life in the industrial world. This is the world we live in. Every year, 1,500 new chemicals are added, and most of them have been produced since the 40s. At the same time, and this is not a cause and effect, but we're in observation, we're noticing a rise in chronic diseases in the United States. One in six children now diagnosed with a developmental disorder. The prevalence of autism has gone up. And again, granted, some of that is improvement in diagnosis, but that's not the full explanation. Um, childhood leukemia, we're doing better at treating, but the incidence is up. One issue that's very important to understand is how we regulate chemicals in the United States. This is incredibly complicated, and I'm going to try to sort through some of it, but I probably can't go through all of it with you right now. So if we look at TOSCA, that's the Toxic Substances Control Act, that is currently uh, in force. It was created in 1976. That's how far behind the times we are. And that just regulates the EPA. And that's what's called a risk-based approach, meaning that you don't have to test these chemicals before they come onto the market. You actually let them onto the market and then they can, if we find there's a problem, then we'll take them off, which is different from what you see on the other side. The European Union takes the precautionary principle where they actually require toxicity data before something can go on the market or stay on the market. Going back over to this side, in 1996, we actually grandfathered in 62,000 chemicals when that act went into effect, one of those chemicals being BPA. But then when you look at how things are regulated, the FDA actually regulates cosmetics and they've only banned 11 of the chemicals. And the reason it's the FDA is that the original act was the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Um, so that's where that falls under. So it gets very complicated when we're looking at who's regulating what. For example, BPA, if it's in food packaging, it's under the FDA's jurisdiction. If it's in the thermal paper, it's under the EPA's jurisdiction. Um, why this is important for you to know is right now in Congress they are debating amendments and regulations to improve TOSCA. But there's one thing I want all of you to understand, um, and there was actually an article about it in, in the Journal of the Medical, American Medical Association yesterday or the day before, is that one of the things that they're trying to do is take away the ability of the states to set regulations. And this would be actually be very harmful to do because, as you can see, we haven't done anything since 1976. When it gets on the federal level, things are slow to act. We find that the states can be more fluid and flexible and get things done. For example, the state of Washington was one of the first states to ban BPA. But actually, from what I read, it can't be banned on the national level because it was grandfathered in. So that's how complicated these things can get. But I want you to stay aware that it's an important thing that's going to come up um, and it is currently happening. So what's the role of us as the healthcare providers? Our goal is to provide information to the families, caregivers, and policymakers, and really to help the families sort through all of the information. If you look at a number of societies have made statements 
of how important this is. So the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, and the Endocrine Society have all come out with policy statements which are very strong to discuss the, the health effects of exposure to these chemicals. It's not enough that all of the information is in the research studies and in, in our scientific word out, and that's why these statements are so important. Um, they have um, identified that the developing fetus is uniquely vulnerable. They've also um, talked about underserved populations being at a higher risk and are recommending that all of us as healthcare providers provide anticipatory guidance. So that gets to, well, how do we do this? So I think the first thing that's really important for all of us to do is to take an environmental history. And there's a really nice, um, uh, I, not an acronym, but a, a CHU, to remind yourself how, how to do this. So it's activities, community, household, hobbies, occupation, oral behaviors. Really what we need to know is what's going on in our families outside the clinic. At minimum, we need to know the occupation of both parents. We need to know about teens and where they're working. We need to know where people live. Do they live near a freeway? Do they live near a coal-powered plant? What hobbies do they have? Do they uh, do stained glass where they're involved with lead? Um, if you know the occupations of the family, it's important to say, well, do you take your child to work with you? Does the mom work at a nail salon? Does she work at a dry cleaners? So. The more that we know about life outside the clinic, the better we are able to understand the environmental risks that our patients are uh, encountering. Um, and then other times you're just going to have an opportunity to ask. Um, when I had a nine-year-old that came in, a nine-year-old boy with breast development, we had to sort of scratch our head like where this is coming from. Um, and what happened was mom said, well, you know, we started using this new shampoo a couple of months ago. Long story short, she brought in a list of um, the ingredients in the shampoo. I asked a librarian at the medical school to help me do a lit search, and we found that one of the chemicals or two of the chemicals were endocrine disruptors. So we told them to stop using the shampoo. Turns out that um, the breast buds um, uh, went away, so she stopped using that shampoo. But that was sort of an opportunity to take an environmental history based on how the patient presented. And here's some resources. Um, I'm going to put a plug in for the last one because uh, a few members of um, the group that I work with developed this and it's, it's really a nice tool in the sense that it looks at food, water, personal, home and work. It has really colorful pictures on it. It's easy to read. It has clear information and, and advice and it's basically a synopsis of my talk in two pages. So let's do a couple of case studies just for fun. So here's the mom. She comes in at a prenatal visit and she is worried or asking you about um, mercury in the fish. She's heard a lot about mercury being uh, damaging to the developing brain. She typically eats about once or twice a week and she wants to know if that puts her fetus at risk. And she also has a five-year-old son and wants to know if he can eat fish too. So what advice would you give? So the first thing I want you to know is the difference between methyl and ethyl mercury. So methyl mercury is the mercury that you're going to find in fish, and ethyl mercury is the um, mercury that you find in thimerosal, which is not in any more of our vaccines, but it might be in one vaccine in your clinic if you still have multi-dose vials of influenza vaccine. But it, they're metabolized very differently, so the methyl mercury does accumulate in the body. And what this slide is demonstrating is that people have gotten this message, that at high levels it's causing neurodevelopmental problems, and even at lower levels we're seeing some effects. Families have gotten that message so strong that I think they're not seeing the positive side of fish. And just a brief um, overview with this picture to show you why, why um, some fish have it and why some don't, but basically you'll see it um, comes from coal-powered plants, it gets in the food cycle, and it bioaccumulates in the larger fish and the larger predators. Moves up the food chain. So what advice do you want to give? And I think this is really important to get the advice right because I think we went a little far the other way. I think it's important to really emphasize that fish is an important part of the nutritious diet, and I would start there. I would also emphasize that the omega-3s 
actually are good for the brain. And there are studies that, that show that. But just emphasize to people they are good. But the key point is specifying two servings a week of a low or even a very low mercury fish. And then give them a list of those. And I'll give you some references there. So basically, I think one of the other challenges is remembering, well, now what's the low fish and which one's the high? And I even get them confused. So when you look at the low, I would emphasize more the low and get that into someone's thinking rather than what to avoid, because then they know what to eat. Um, so when you look at that, it would be fresh salmon, the shrimp, tilapia, anchovies, scallops, clams, oysters, sardines. But different lists will tell you different things, so I don't want your patients to be confused. Um, the high ones, just for your knowledge, are the shark, the swordfish, tile, the tilefish, which I've never seen, um, king mackerel, orange ruffy, and I've seen some that show grouper too. Um, as far as the last statement, identify the anglers. So the anglers are your sport fish and they tend to um, bring the fish home and eat it and they like to get the biggest fish because that's good to get the big fish. So that's one issue that you really need to um, identify if you have some families um, that are uh, big into fishing or culturally they are. It's important because they're the ones that are really at higher risk. So here's a couple of nice handouts. Um, the last one is particularly nice, the one from um, New York City. Um, I would really recommend going to that website and, and copying some of those because it, it makes a nice little handy um, pocket size fish and it has it even differentiates very low mercury fish from low mercury fish and you can actually just put it in your wallet so you can just take it out when you're at the grocery store and say, oh, I don't remember what the doctor told me, but you can kind of carry that with you. So I think that's handy. So the next state case study will be lead. Um, so in this one, you're seeing a three-year-old girl. She does not have a history of um, uh, any illnesses or nothing significant. Um, and her venous blood level, I'm going to do venous because the capillaries are so confusing and you really have to um, redo those if you get them because of a lot of contamination. Let's assume it's a venous. So she had a three at her one-year check and a 13 at her two-year check. And she has a sister that had an eight at a recent visit. And you know that all the windows in their multi-unit building were recently replaced. Depending on the state that you live in, and you really should know what the levels are for your state for action, you may have an environmental visit. In my state of Wisconsin, unfortunately, our level is 15. If you live in New York, uh, 10 would trigger an, ev an environmental evaluation. And I understand if you're in San Francisco, you could even get one if it's four or five. So it, there's a lot of regional variability, whether you can get somebody to go to the home and look around and see what's going on. The next slide um, is probably obvious to, to all of us, uh, all of you, in that it's not just IQ. We know that the effects of lead are on what we call the executive function of the brain. Those abilities that kids really need to pay attention, to control their emotions, to control their behavior. And when you look at the effects of it long term, you can see that it affects how children learn at school, their success in school. There's some studies that link it to fourth grade suspension rates, some other studies linking it to high school graduation and incarceration rates. So we know there's a toxic legacy. We know we can do something about it. We know what the problem is and we really need to work hard on primary prevention. There's also new research coming out uh, repeatedly about how lower levels really do have an impact. And um, Some of the latest research I looked at showed um, impacts even at levels of 5 to 10. So even if, if the patient is going to have an environmental assessment, it's not going to happen next week. You're going to have a worried parent sitting in front of you. So what's the practical advice that you tell this family? So you tell them, this is what you need to do to decrease your child's exposure to lead. They need to have a good intake of calcium and iron-rich foods. Frequent meals, because the presence of food in the gut will actually prevent absorption of the lead. Look at the kids' toys. Um, of course, many imported toys had lead. In fact, there was a local story here on the news that they looked at toys from Walgreens, Goodwill, and the dollar store. And the dollar store had so many toys that they were selling that had lead in it. 
and so did Goodwill, and Walgreens actually did very well in this. But you think the Consumer Product Safety Commission is protecting us against all of these toys, and they're actually not. It's important to wet mop the floors, use a HEPA vac if you can. If there's concern about lead pipes, which I actually did have in my house, you're supposed to run the water for two minutes before you actually start to use any of the water. Consider using bottled water and maybe even a Brita filter. Here's an interesting little tidbit I'm going to tell you. So the EPA regulates tap water, and the maximum is 15 parts per billion. The FDA regulates bottled water, and their maximum is 5 parts per billion. Bottled water is actually considered a food. So the next slide is going to show you the impact of public policy and how that can make a, good, a great difference. So the little pink circles are what the CDC uh, listed as their level of concern, and then the little green circles are the average blood lead levels in the United States from 1965 to 2005. So if you look at 1965, um, the level that the CDC thought was uh, concern was 60. And as the research came out about the effects of lead, you can see that number just going down, 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 down. And I probably wouldn't even have to put an arrow in there to show you when lead came out of the gasoline because you could see the impact on the average um, blood lead levels. But basically it started lowering it actually in the 70s and it wasn't fully out until 1995. But if you looked at that, and I didn't have the other things on the side, you may say, well, what are you worried about? Look, it's practically down to zero. But the important thing is averages are, and if you look at um, specific groups, and if you look at the Rochester, New York, 7%, Allentown, Pennsylvania, 23%, and I bet if I looked local here at Milwaukee, we would see high levels too. And you could even, even focus it down more. If you looked at a specific zip code, you can find higher levels. So don't, don't let that data confuse you. And if I extended the graph out more, the new level that um, is a reference level by the CDC is now considered to be five. And I can tell you that there are very few states in the United States that use five as the um, measure of going out and uh, looking in the community. So here's some references on lead. Uh, some, um, one of the best is your state health department's lead poisoning prevention program. Whenever I've gone to their website or reached out to the individuals here in Wisconsin, they have been so helpful with handouts and information. These people are incredibly knowledgeable. So most or all states will have these. So let's do a case study that talks about indoor exposures. So here we have an eight-year-old boy. He's got persistent asthma and he's in your office with an asthma exacerbation. He doesn't have a cold, uh, no runny nose, no, it's not allergy season, and he's gotten his flu shot. He did a great job taking care of this one. But during his nebulizer treatment, mom kind of casually mentions to you that his asthma symptoms get worse while he's in the apartment. So what questions do you ask next? And I bet all of you don't even need this next slide. I think you already know. So when you start to think of what he could be exposed to in that house, it could be mold, dust mites, do they have a cat? Um, is somebody smoking in the household? Are there cockroaches? Are there other chemical irritants? And then pesticides. And I feel like you probably know a lot about asthma, so I'm going to use this as a segue to move into pesticides because there's some new research on out about pesticides as an indoor pollutant. So as you can see, the EPA says that 80% of most people's exposure to pesticides occurs indoors and that the number and concentration of pesticides found in household dust exceeds those in food, soil, and air. And remembering back what I was saying about children, they're down on the floor, they're close to the ground, they're going to get more of this dust. I have a new respect for dust. I'm cleaning my house better now. So pesticide contamination in the home can last for years too, especially if it gets incorporated into the carpet. And one common thing, one thing that you can say to families is, you know what, take your shoes off when you get to the door. You'll bring in less uh, pesticide residues, um, you know, uh, other things that come in off the street, dirt, and I found that I have to vacuum less if I take my shoes off. Um, so a few studies I want to tell you about. Um, 
Oh, let me go back. I just want to tell you one story. So we have a public health nurse that's involved with our group, and she does home visits to um, pregnant moms who are at at risk. And she noticed a raid can sitting next to the mom's bedside. And she asked about that. And mom said, oh, yeah, yeah, we have um, cockroaches, so I just kind of spray. I spray a lot. And it was an opportunity for that nurse to intervene and explain to the mom that that's probably not a good idea, you know, and to kind of gently say to her that there's more harm to her um, uh, baby and the fact that she's pregnant than in going after these um, cockroaches. So um, you have to take opportunities when you can get them, and a home visit is a great opportunity to see what's actually happening. We should do more of those. So a couple of studies I want to tell you about. Um, one that was in environmental health perspectives in 2010, and it, it was a meta-analysis of about 15 studies, and that showed that Exposure during pregnancy increases the risk of childhood leukemia in that baby. And then another, another study that came out just this fall in pediatrics, which was um, really quite interesting because most people, most pediatricians are, uh, are not reading environmental health perspectives. So it was, a, it was good to have it come out in a journal that's commonly read. And this was a meta-analysis of actually 277 studies. And that showed that residential indoor exposure during childhood was associated with an, an increased risk of both childhood leukemia and lymphoma. So that was, um, I think that surprised a lot of people to see that. And it's good to see environmental issues coming to the forefront. So um, when patients are dealing with um, whether it's um, pests or um, insects or whatever in their home, it's really important to talk about integrated pest management. I won't go into a lot of detail on this, but basically you want to get at the problem rather than make a new problem. So fixing the water issues, keeping the food sealed and blocking entry, or having someone who is a certified pest control operator um, is really important to do. Um, this time of year we have a lot of ants and I use these um, little, um, and they're called taro and it has something inside and the ants crawl in so I don't have to spray it around. So there are things around that you can use that are less harmful. So um, without, um, one thing that we need to talk about is radon. So Radon is the second most common cause of lung cancer. And the exposure in radon, I, I, this is an, a nice picture, but you can actually get your state's picture too. So any areas that are red or orange are at higher risk. Radon really um, is naturally occurring in the soil. Um, it is silent. It's an indoor health hazard that has no smell, no color, no, color, no taste. And if you don't think of it, you, you won't think about it. <laughs> um, basically, it is um, an easy test to do. I did it at my house. It cost about $30, and mitigation actually works if you do have an elevated level. Um, the other factor is that the risk of lung cancer is actually 10 to 20 times greater in smokers exposed to radon. And that emphasizes this point of when we look at a lot of toxins, we're looking at them one at a time, but sometimes when you see them work together, the impact is actually greater. Um, briefly, I'm just going to comment on uh, the volatile organic compounds, another potential indoor exposure. It causes carcinogenic and reproductive health issues. It's in nail polish remover, some personal products, paints and glues. Um, ways to prevent this is to air out the dry clean clothes. When I get close to the dry cleaner, I rip the plastic off and I kind of hang it in the yard for a couple of minutes or air it out. Um, don't use mothballs. If a mom says she's going to paint the nursery, first of all, don't have her paint, but have somebody um, use the low VOC paints. Um, just a, con a couple of practical things that you can talk to patients about. And we'll do a quick study in plastics. So this is a new mother asking if she should use plastic or glass. And about 15 years ago, I had a dad ask me what I thought about BPA in plastic bottles. Well, 15 years ago, I didn't even know what the word BPA was. So I said to the dad, uh, <clears throat> can you tell me why you asked? Well, he's a chemist, and he knew a lot more than I did. So he educated me on this issue. 
So what advice do you give? So I'm just going to highlight this briefly because your next lecture is going to go in great detail. So you've heard a lot probably about BPA and BPS and that it definitely is an endocrine disruptor that can harm the reproductive systems. It's associated with prostate cancer, breast cancer. It's now considered an obesogen um, and is related to heart disease and other health issues. It's found in sport water bottles. It kind of is the tough bottle. Um, it's not flexible as opposed to the phthalates, which are flexible. Um, and it's in the lining of cans and thermal receipts. What always surprises me is that in the 40s, they actually knew that this was um, had slight estrogenic properties. Why did they ever put it in the lining of a can? When you think about how a can is treated, it's actually um, treated at the factory with very, very high heat because they don't want any botulism or any other organisms uh, in the can. And maybe they just didn't know at the time that high heat is probably the worst thing um, for BPA because it causes it to leach into the food, which goes into what you talk to patients about. Don't put it in the microwave. Don't put it in your dishwasher. And probably you shouldn't have it at all. And some of the replacement chemicals that you'll hear about BPS and BPE um, really aren't that much better than BPA. Another uh, endocrine disrupting chemical is phthalates. So um, this has been associated with um, abnormal genitalia from low sperm counts in boys to um, increased incidence of hypospadias um, when a mom's been exposed. So there's a whole host of research associated with exposure to phthalates. It's used um, because it adds to flexibility. It's used in nail polish. It actually is often used to carry a fragrance. So if I ever see the word fragrance, I just assume there's going to be phthalates in it. It's in IV tubing. It can be in toys. But the good news is they did take it out of some of the infant toys. Um, so what do you tell patients? Well, here's what patients are seeing when they go to the store. BPA-free, BPA-free. Well, the ones on the far right, the binky, they're okay, actually, because they, they have silicon in them. Uh, the two on the left that say BPA-free, well, if you're going to put, I would say, if you're going to put, like, Cheerios or a snack in it, it's fine. The real issue is when these products are heated or they're, you have them for a long time and they start to break down. And most of these are probably going to have BPS in them. Um, so I still would not put them in the microwave. I would not do all those things that um, will cause it to leach into the food. I personally have gotten rid of a lot of plastic in my home, but I still have a couple of things like this. So the important thing that you can say to your patients about bisphenols is that changing habits can lower the levels. And I think this is really important because unlike PCBs and chemicals like that that are persistent chemicals, this one is not. This one's excreted in the urine. And if you make changes, you can actually lower your level. Um, so this is um, something you can tell patients. You can do something about this by changing your habits. So here's your anticipatory guidance. A lot of things I said already, avoiding heating them. Try to eat less canned foods. Um, look for the certain plastics, avoiding three, six, and seven. Try to uh, get phthalate-free children's toys. Most of them are now. Avoid air fresheners, things like that. So a few other endocrine disrupting chemicals I want to talk about. One is um, the chemicals that we find in in the couches, which are no longer in the couches. So that's good news. So the flame retardants um, have recently been phased out of the couches. They're still found in electronics. You're still going to find them in car seats. And they, too, can end up in the dust in your house. So again, same concept. Dust frequently with a moist cloth. Minimize time in car seats. So now you see kids in car, car seats. They'll, we call it bucket time at, at the office when, where I worked. Um, and the, the child seems to always be in the bucket, whether it's in the car or in the, you can then convert them into strollers. So try to, to take the child out of the seat. And I think it's important to vacuum them and um, minimize that time if you can. 
Um, this one's kind of an a, a interesting story about public policy in that the flame returns were actually moved from, removed from children's pajamas way back in 1976. Um, California and originally thought that flame returns were a good idea, so they set up some state legislation to put it in, in um, most of our um, foam, foam furniture. Then we found out that uh, flame returns were not good. First of all, they didn't work very well, and they, we understood better that they were endocrine disruptors, which wasn't understood years ago. So California took their um, recommendation and as uh, the country followed California on this. So now, if you buy a new couch, your couch likely does not have flame returns in it. But it's worthwhile to ask. Um, I'm impressed by how far this has come because most of the people at the furniture stores um, actually know about this. But what if you have a family that has an old couch? Well, you can tell them some things to do to um, mitigate the effect of it. And that would be to make sure it's covered so that um, the old foam doesn't get out. Um, so just one more thing to think about. Um, triclosan or triclosan, I've heard it said both ways, is in a lot of products as an antimicrobial agent. Well, over the years they have found out that it is not even a very effective micro antimicrobial agent. So many companies are taking it out of their products. It's often in soaps, toothpaste, mouthwashes, um, acne medicines as listed there, deodorants, etc. So I can tell you for a fact that Crest toothpaste no longer has it, but Colgate still does. I went on their website and they still have it in there. It's actually found in urine samples and detected in breast milk. Basically, if you can look for it on the label, it's often listed, but if you see antimicrobial or antibacterial, I would just assume that that's in it. And one of the things that I have families do is look at the soaps um, at their children's daycare. Like what is in that soap and a couple well, mom said, well, the way I've sort of gotten around that politely to the daycare is to say, well, I'll provide the soap for your daycare rather than say, well, I don't want this one with this chemical in it. So uh, she offered to bring some in for the daycare. So this is real important that everyone should know that the pediatric environmental health specialty units are there to help you. So this is the network, so if you look at where you are in the country, you can call these individuals. Um, I called Dr. Susan Buchanan a couple of weeks ago. She called me back very quickly. Um, they have uh, a lot of information. They have um, resources for you. They're there to help you. And I want to thank, actually, Dr. Mark Miller, from um, the California PESHU and Dr. Susan Buchanan for um, sharing some slides and looking over this talk with me today. A um, couple more resources I have for you there. The um, UCSF has uh, their program on reproductive health and the environment. They have some really excellent books, uh, little handouts that you can use in your clinic. Um, one that I do is the Breast Cancer Fund. Um, they are, they say they're green, not pink. They have a lot of good information. Um, the Story of Health, if you take that course, you can actually get CME credit for that. So what's my take home message? Continue to expand your knowledge, educate your patients, and educate your colleagues. Offer to do a lunch and learn. I'm encouraging you to advocate for improved public policy because that really does make a difference for your patients. Join the AAP. Committee on Environmental Health, join PSR, and actually connect with other doctors in your area that are interested in environmental health. And I want to thank Kathy for Kathy Attar for helping me with these slides. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Neary. This is Kathy uh, Attar again. Um, so we have a couple of we just have a couple of questions. So I just wanted to remind folks that if you do have um, so questions, you can go ahead and type it into the question box on the panel over there, because um, we're, that's what we're going to be doing right now. Uh, um, so uh, in terms of the first question, um, uh, Dr. Neary, she, there's a person, someone had a question regarding um, how to get uh, possibly toxins out of your uh, tap water. And they had a question about whether using reverse osmosis or carbon filters were recommended to remove metals or other toxins in, in the water. So 
Now, granted, I'm not uh, an expert. I'm a pediatrician who reads a lot. So from my understanding, the reverse osmosis is like the top of the line, that that is the best. But I understand it's very expensive. Um, depending on what you're trying to get out of your water, you have to read what what you're using. So at my house, I, I was looking at something where it and now actually takes out um, lead, um, uh, certain um, other, um, what is it, like perchlorate or some of those chemicals. And now I just got a new one that takes out um, some pharmaceuticals. So I think you really have to ask the questions of the um, what the product is. Great. Thank you. And then um, we also had a question regarding um, kind of the anticipatory guidance that we that you went through in, in your presentation. And the a person wanted to know: Are there um, are there best practices for, envir for environmental medicine, or simply the anticipatory guidance? Um. I'm actually not sure what that individual meant by the difference between anticipatory guidance and best practices. I I don't yeah I, I don't know if um if she, if the person was talking about like a standard like a a, a specific standard recommendation um, mm -hmm. and I, I think I mean I know you know AAP has the green book um, there mm -hmm. so there's that kind of standard um, and other uh, other agencies like that have specific types of um, recommendations and, and, and things like that. So, um, right. and, and, and I would I, say that I'll, it, I would say that a lot of the anticipatory guidance that comes from this presentation comes from those sources as well. Correct. Right. I'd say like so. There's some standard practices that probably we all do involving lead, for example. But then some of the uh, environmental exposures can actually be unique to the area of the country that you live in. So um, I think, like I said, your best resource is the, the pay shoes that serve your region. Sure. Right. No, I think, yeah, I think that's great. Um, okay. So did anyone, so those were the several questions that we had, uh, folks had typed in, but um, if anyone, I don't know if anyone wanted to, to type a few other quick questions, um, and if if not, um, like I said at the beginning, uh, this webinar is going to be um, recorded and put up on our website, so you'll be able to have access to it again. Um, and we also will be um, having our second uh, webinar that's going to be focusing on endocrine disruptors, and that's going to be on April 19th, and there will be a um, kind of an outreach email going out probably maybe next week or the week after. So folks want to keep a lookout for that as well. Um, Can I add one more thing? If anybody's sure. on Twitter, um, yes. actually my handle is at Beth Neary MD. I have found um, a lot of good resources on Twitter, um, like using a hashtag environment. Um, and I found out about webinars and I found out about um, courses to take. And so I think if this is something you're really interested in, there's information out there, but you sort of have to seek it out. Sure. No, definitely. Definitely. And I would also, I would just also say if folks um, have more specific questions about these Train the Trainer webinars and then also how you can actually um, go out into your community and train other health professionals, that they can feel free to give me, uh, me and uh, my email is k-a-t-t-a-r at psr.org. Um, what's it? My first name is Kathy, last name is Attar, A-T-T-A-R. Um, so it looks like that's, that's the questions we had. And so um, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Neary so much for uh, giving her time this evening and uh, providing us with... Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering whether... Um, uh, there are a number of other questions um, in the question box, and yeah, I actually, yeah, okay. I actually, I, um, the I'm interested in, I'm sorry, oh, you're right, I didn't click down, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, 
and Sorry perhaps if you unmute people, um, that might be useful for the people who have questions. Sure. So let me, and I, I apologize, I didn't see all the other emails. Um, and so uh, one, of the, uh, one of the questions was, uh, will the handouts be made available after the webinar? So like I said, the presentation is going to be um, on, made, uh, it's going to be put on our website. Um, and then down the road, we also will have um, some ancillary uh, patient materials that, that is also going to be on our website. Um, probably within the next couple of months, we're going to have that information as well up. Um, Okay, and so, um, so a second question is um, the regarding the uh, CDC reference level for lead, and they're okay. asking um, that they know that that level is five, and then they want to know why other states uh, are slow to adopt the standard. Um, I exactly have the same question. Um, I don't. I don't know why there's so much variability in the states. I mean, they came out with that recommendation of five back in 2012. That's four years ago. And my state, I'm embarrassed to say, Wisconsin, is still using 15, which is actually from like 20 years ago. So that's one thing that I think we need to advocate about. And I think you sort of strike when the fire's hot. And everybody's talking about lead now because of the Flint issues. So if you want to bring that up with people, legislators in your community, this is the time they'll listen to you. Definitely. So then we also had a question about, um, they asked, can you tell us what CO exposures you ask about besides smoking? And what would you recommend pregnant women do to minimize risk of neonatal CO exposure? I'm sorry, I didn't hear, what was that? Oh, carbon, did you say carbon monoxide? What's, yeah. I didn't hear. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. Um, they're asking about carbon monoxide exposures. Okay. Can I punt that to the third uh, webinar since she's going to be talking about um, sure. prenatal and life? Get, okay. Yeah. 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 And we can, I can also get back to her in terms of more specific information. So okay. another person had, maybe, had a question. Go ahead. I'm sorry? No, I, I was going to say, person give that question to the, um, the person who's going to do the third webinar. So then um, they wanted to know, uh, another person wanted to know about a, a specific book if they wanted to really dive deep into this information. Did you have a okay. specific book or book? I get it. It's right on my coffee table. <laughs> okay. So I, I would recommend um, Pediatric Environmental Health, which is um, published by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, I have the third edition. My understanding is they're going to be coming out with a new one soon. Um, I also took a environmental health book that my daughter, who was doing her master's in public health, I looked at her book too. So I think if you um, look at the pediatric environmental health book, they'll give you a lot of really good references. That's a good place to start. Great. And so there's another question about uh, blood tests. They wanted to know if there are any blood tests for testing phthalates or other plastics. That's a good question. I do not think that there are. I do not think so. Um, I know that BPA can be looked at in the urine, um, but I don't. I'm not aware of any tests that look at um, phthalates at this point. But that could be my lack of knowledge. Okay, I, now I think that was the last uh, question. Let me just double check again. Well, Trish O'Day, um, Trish, do you want to ask your question online? You're unmuted. Am I unmuted now? Yep. Okay. I, um, I'm going to be, my name is Trish O'Day and I'm an RN, a public health nurse in Austin, Texas. And our chapter of PSR here was very lucky to receive a grant just recently from the Episcopal Health Foundation to do toxics education in prenatal classes in low-income clinics. 
and I'll be the project manager for this. And we have six months to develop curriculum, develop class materials, do a focus study, and things like that, and then start um, going in. I'll hire bilingual nurses or promotoras to deliver the content, Spanish, English. And um, then in September or October, we'll start doing these educational sessions in um, prenatal classes or parenting classes. My question was, should, do you think I should also include information about where to get help? Most people are renters, for example, and they might not be able to get their <coughs> landlord to um, uh, deal with pesticides in a responsible manner. So I'm wondering if I should include information about how to contact the Tenants Council or the local health department for such kinds of issues. First, your project sounds amazing, and you hit on a point that I actually had in my notes and I didn't actually talk about, that that's an important point. When you find that there's an elevated lead or there's an issue, some of my patients would say, I really I don't want to say anything because I don't want to um, you know, put myself at risk. You know, My landlord might say, hey, you're a troublemaker. You know, I'm not going to renew your, your, um, your yes. um, license or whatever, your rent. Um, and so I think you hit on an excellent point. And so what you want to do is, is check who, who is the advocate for people in low-income housing um, in your area. So if, if it's a HUD project, I think they're regulated in different ways than if it's an independent landlord. But that's an excellent, excellent question because there was a group in, in Boston that was having problems with children with asthma. And the way that they solved the problem is they hired a lawyer who wrote letters to the um, owners of these apartments that weren't being fixed and had mold. And the power of the lawyer was th what made the difference for, the, for those families. So um, you're smart to think about that in advance. OK, thank you. Um, this is Catherine. Um, and I was wondering if of the people who are on the line, if you would raise your hand, if you're planning on um, giving this particular presentation to residents or nursing students or PA students or NP students yourself. So Sally raised her hand. Marie, you can raise your hand by going on the um, sidebar. <clears throat> Alrighty. Um, that was part of our intent. Margaret just raised her hand. Thank you. Um, and so if people who are on the call, um, what we really, really, really would love to see is feedback on um, what else you feel like you would need to know um, to be able to present this material. Um, and you know, as, as you see, you don't have to know all the answers, um, but the more we understand about what you would like to, to know, um, the better equipped we can help you be in doing this type of presentation. Is there a Another script? Us, well, give us, give us feedback. Beth, is um, there a script? Um, I could write one up if you want me to. I think yeah, that would be great. Yeah, this is this is Kathy. I was that was my plan after after the webinar was to to develop a script for it. Um, I had a question. Um, you mentioned radon. What is the mitigation for radon? Um, basically, they have to do something to sort of air out your basement. So um, my neighbor across the street has to have it done. And it, it can be fairly expensive, so, um, but it's, it's not that hard to do. They just have to uh, put this pipe so that they can uh, air out, get the air out of your basement, because that's where it's coming from.
Okay, this is Kathy. Um, did uh, any other folks have any other questions? Great, and please give us feedback. I mean, this is the first time we did it. I, I won't take it as criticism. I'll take it as constructive comments. Tell us what you liked and what you didn't like, and because that's the only way we'll improve this. This and is trash. Always, if, I, uh, if I'm still unmuted, could we get Dr. Neary's email? I'm not sure how to spell Dr. Neary, so if we could get your email, sure. that'd be wonderful. Do you want me to just say it, or um, so it's B as in boy, Neary, N-E-A-R-Y, 55 at gmail.com. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so thanks again for, for joining us. Um, and like I said, there, uh, the second webinar is going to be on April 19th, and it's going to the focus is going to be on environmental. Um, I'm sorry, endocrine disrupting chemicals. And um, we haven't finalized the date for the third webinar, but um, we're going to be doing that it, real soon, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be in the month of May. Um, so thanks again, Dr. Neary. Um, I also wanted to thank Julia Morgan, who's our web manager. Um, she made sure everything technically worked worked well, and uh, I really appreciate her having on the having her on the webinar tonight. So thanks everyone for, for before, joining us. Wait, before we go, can I say one more thing? Um, the the nurse yeah. who I spoke to in Austin, Texas. Um, can you email me? I would love to hear more about your program because maybe by sharing what you're doing, you, you can help us do something similar here. Yes, I'll be glad to. Great. All right. Thank, thank well, you thank again. You. And, and, thank uh, you again, Kathy. Yep. Have a good night.